But listen closely. Not for very much longer. I've got to keep control. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. There must have been some sort of a misprint. All I ever wanted, all I ever needed, was here in my arms. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Words are very unnecessary. And Big Anklevich. They can only do harm. So we're rolling. Placido Domingo, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And every time we do one of these, it feels like... Feels like the first time. Oh. Feels like the very first time in a really long time. Every time we do one of these, an angel gets its wings. Those poor, poor wingless angels. Uh, this is a Dune Steve. This is the show we used to do. Yeah, the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hmm. Is it too late to change the name? (laughs) (laughs) Well, maybe Uh, not. I don't know. We could probably change it to something else. um, This is a second time doing this episode. Um, Yeah, sorry. The engine was running there. Uh, We're in the car once again. We fogged it up recording for an hour. And then we thought we ought to put in a battery that is... Uh, that works. <laughs> Rich has this thing where he, he he doesn't throw away batteries. The battery runs out on him, and he puts it like back in the bag and and mixes it up. It's a sickness. Puts, it's like Russian roulette. He puts but it with batteries. He puts it into the bag full of uh, good batteries, and then just shakes it around so you can't even know which one it was. He's not exaggerating either. I do it. And I always, afterward, it's like, why did I do that? It's like the serial killer with the split personality. It's like, what? Why would I kill the librarian? She's always been nice. That's strange. We've been bitten by it at least five times, I'd say, where the battery just died on us. And you're like, oh, yeah. I think think that one already died on me last night, too. Sorry, guys. (laughs) The first time we went through this episode, I asked... If people were feeling generous, if they would donate to the show, and that with the proceeds I would use, I would (laughs) buy one of those little SD cards for the uh, recorder that we're using right now because I've filled it up. And and this, this, I wish that Zoom, the Zoom H1 company were our sponsor so that I could do testimonials about how much I love this little device and how it's changed my life to have a portable recorder that I can take everywhere. So I've, I've got my own little podcast. I've got audiobooks that I do. And then I, I record like journal entries and I brainstorm and come up with story ideas or try and work through my novel and all that. But I don't want to delete that stuff. And so it's filled up and there's always only about an hour of free time on there and then I have to transfer the file that I just recorded and delete it and then record a new file and and Big said you know those little SD cards they don't cost a lot of money and it would save you so much headache I mean even today I was recording this audiobook and uh, sure enough the batter the uh, hard drive was full but I didn't realize it until uh, you know I finished the chapter and then looked and it's like oh shoot now I have to a transfer all of this off of my hard drive, then delete, then do it again. So yes, the first time we recorded this episode, in far fewer words, I asked, please donate to the show if you're feeling generous. And and, and sorry, Big, uh, do, have we even an, introduced ourselves? I don't know. Who said the name of the podcast? Wow, I, it's an hour later and now I'm yawning, so this could be trouble. Yeah. Um. Ah, sorry, guys. Um. Announcer Man is here. Yeah, yeah, since you've been gone. Thank you, Announcer Man. Sorry, I I don't know why I mentioned Announcer Man before us. Oh, it's because he actually had something to do the first time we recorded this. Yes, you're right. Uh, But now I don't have the heart to ask him to do it again. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, and I'm here. I'm Big Anglovich. I'm uh, one of your co-hosts. Here at my right is... Yes? Rich Outfield. That's that's me. Uh, the, The guy with egg on his face. I do recall the first time that we did this episode saying we would not be here if it weren't for Justin Charles, the one remaining listener who cares about the show. Now, that's an exaggeration. How many 
exactly are there out there that care about this? I would say there's a few. He's the one who's willing to put it all on the line, man. And he loves it, I think. Every time he gets a chance to edit a story, he's like, Oh, yeah! This is what I live for! And that's just weird that uh, that he would talk that way. But yeah, you know, I'm not going to judge. I'll take the, any help, even if it's funny <laughs> talking help. He produced our, our story for us today. We are doing... Uh, we're almost to the end of the line on these triple word score stories. Can you believe that? Uh, I, I cannot believe it. Yeah, there is... Thank goodness, guys. After today's story, there are only two left. Oh, I, I don't know if I can commit to two more. Oh, One geez. of them is yours. Okay, well, I think we can probably manage, <laughs> manage one more, maybe. Um, but anyhow, yeah, the, the triple word score stories were created so that we would have an easy time of it. They, they're, they're only allowed to be 2,000 words long or less. And we thought, well, you know, that'll make them easy to produce. And maybe they were the first couple were easy to produce. But even the guy that gets to oil down the Hawaiian Tropic girls for their big shoot starts to loathe his job after a while. It's just yeah, his hands nature. get tired when they, when, you know, at, at the 50th. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, man, my thumb hurts. But, uh, yeah, the thing that was so great about the triple word score stories were picking the words. We did this thing where in your old house, we picked three random words out of a hat. And we had our fans just throw in whatever words they wanted to. And it was delightful picking these words and assigning them to the people that wanted to do the contest. And that's where the delight ended. <laughs> um, after that, it's like, okay, well, you guys have to read all of the stories. And then you have to review all the stories. And then you're going to have to either narrate or do a character on all of the stories. And then you're going to have to edit that or produce that. And then you're going to have to do an episode about each one of the stories. And <sighs> I wish I could just announce a new triple word score story contest and just do the handing out of the words part and then just let it go like the evil disney bitch princess just uh <laughs> let it yeah, okay here's here's the announcement the triple word score contest will be passing from our hands and become exclusively the property of marshall latham's journey into <laughs> into into futility podcast and so we'll do the fun part where we come up with twisted <laughs> words that you have to fit into your stories. And I'll, I'll write a story, too. I'll go that far. Okay. But then other people Bring have back to do that, the you. happy, the happy, the heavy lifting. I think Marshall would do great lifting heavy things. He's a strong guy. Agreed. So today's story is called The Mosquito Room by Catherine Inskip. Catherine and, Inskip? Yeah. Yeah, she's been on the show before, but not as a not as writer. a writer. No, she, I know she at least did the voice, the the narration for, in the gloaming, in the gloamer. <laughs> <laughs> you somehow restrained yourself from making that joke the first time we did this episode, but this time you're like to hell with it. I'm saying in the gloamer. <laughs> So she did that. I, I want to say she did a voice on something else, too. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. Because we're in a parking lot, and it's freezing outside, and the windows are fogged up because we've been talking for an hour. And it's hard to look things up in that kind of a situation. So, we're not going <laughs> to. Just know that she has been around before. <laughs> she has. And uh, it's been a long, long time since she wrote the story. But uh, hopefully it was worth the wait. Ooh, I'm not able to sell that. Do you want to tell the... I mean, I was going to say briefly tell the audience uh, how oh, the Triple Work Store story works, but it doesn't have to be briefly, does it? It's uh, Not really. You put in a brand new battery, and so it's not like uh, there we you know, go. it's going to run out. <laughs> but um, Not until next week when we get together again, then it'll run out on us another time. Gosh, guys. Okay, go ahead. You were going to tell the audience... Uh, if any of them are remaining. <laughs> oh, you know what? We did like a cat joke before that we didn't do this. Oh, no, that's still coming. <laughs> People are going to hate this episode of how much we refer to the one that doesn't exist. We did that with, there was a time when we, you went to Disneyland, or I, somebody went to Disneyland, you did. And we did this entire episode where, talking about Disneyland. 
And I don't know what the problem was. You know, the microphone was turned off or something like that. And so we had to sit down and do it again. And all we could do was say, uh, I think I told this story the first time. I told it better the first time. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I got a hand job on Pirates of the Caribbean. And it didn't feel as spontaneous. And, you know, it didn't feel as genuine the second time because it was like we were giving rote lines we were telling you know not organically telling stories and i'd go oh, oh, oh you forgot this part which <laughs> wouldn't naturally have happened because I, I would have been hearing the story for the first time and uh it was it's a small world it wasn't pirates so it makes that way more disturbing a story <laughs> so anyways the way the triple word score story worked Every author got three random words, as we said before, drawn from a hat. A bunch of people just made lists of words, and then uh, we cut them all out, put them in a hat, and picked them out. Live on the show, even. And then you had those three words, and you were supposed to take those words and somehow intrinsically make them a part of your story. Hopefully, I mean, the, the general idea is that the story arises from these words you got these words and you're like oh okay well i already have a story though i can just put those words into real easy no instead these words gives you the idea for the story you know that's what we kind of hope it was supposed happen. to inspire yeah we didn't want people to just like have their character say blah 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 what are you saying oh nothing and then they go on <laughs> with the story you know that's you know how funny that would be it's like wood tick Stephen Hawking. Gum. What was that, honey? Oh, nothing. And then the story begins. You know, I expected there might be one or two like that, but we didn't get any like that. I think most people really tried and really worked them into their story. And I think maybe the uh, word count limit of 2,000, maybe that inspired people a little. Because they're like, nah, I can put effort into 2,000 words. I mean, that's small. That'll only take me a little bit of time. Maybe it was something like that. I don't know. But anyways, uh, Catherine's words were notebook, invention, and energizer bunny. Mm. That's one of those words. We had a bunch of those. Energizer bunny. Uh, we had lots of celebrity names like uh, Sylvester Stallone and Michael Jackson and... Avril Lavigne. Yes. <laughs> George Lucas, etc. A lot of weird words were thrown in there for some people where they got their words and you're just like, what? How is that going to make a story? But people managed. Now, see, the, I, I disagree. I think Energizer Bunny is a much better word than notebook. You go, oh, notebook. Well, that doesn't inset it. But you think about Energizer Bunny. It's like, okay, well, how, how the hell can I do that? How can I do a story that's not set in the 80s? <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's just me. I, the, the weird words that, you know. Yeah, they might rectal be. Rectal the... thermometer or whatever it is. <laughs> those are the ones that really get your brain going, oh, geez, okay. I don't think rectal thermometer gets your brain going so much as. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know me too well. All right, so here's the story. Uh, it's called Mosquito Room, The Mosquito Room, I believe, by Catherine Inskip. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, produced by Justin Charles. Yes. Who uh, saved our bacon again. Where, you know, I think any culinary expert would say that that bacon is not worth saving. Probably. But he was just like, should I do the Justin Charles impression again? or? <laughs> sure, if you want to. So, boys, I'd really like to save your bacon. I, I think there's lots of uh, good left to be found in the dune, Steve. And so he uh, wow. gently volunteered to for, to keep us from going into that good night. Thank you very much, Justin. Okay, so everybody enjoy the story. We'll be right back when it's over. <laughs> The Mosquito Room by Catherine Inskip. Chris, is it safe to talk? I wondered why Claire was loitering outside the Mosquito Room when she should have been monitoring our colleagues out on damage control ops. It was bad enough that I'd been stuck with doing the work of four other people and hearing everything third hand if I was lucky. But today, I had a bloody tour group traipsing around after me too. Don't worry, 
They're still in the auditorium. There's news? Two reports since the morning briefing. How much do you already know? Less than I wanted to, for sure. Someone's hacked Factory 9's fruiting knotweed. Water filtration screwed. There's untreated effluent everywhere. Uh, oh, and the plants are oozing blood, apparently. Claire winced. Fucking press. Someone's Ed will roll for letting that detail slip through the embargo. I was more concerned with the company's plants. It's true, then? The blood thing? What? No, no. The closest analog is tomato puree. No obvious toxicity. Dave says it doesn't look like Kingdom or Mabcor, but he's still got more tests to run before anyone's coming home. Dave was a naive optimist. Just because it didn't look like the work of one of the company's major rivals didn't mean it wasn't. But they weren't the only possible culprits. Gaia League, then? Nah. Claire said. There's nothing online and not a protester in sight. My money's on a lone activist. It's a pretty amateurish job by all accounts. And people accuse us of bioterror. Claire didn't smile. It was an old joke inside the company, one that dated all the way back to when we took out Monsanto. But she had good reason to take it personally, I reminded myself. Sorry. Never mind. Claire gave the door to the mosquito room a thoughtful look. Speaking of bioterror, did you turn down the soporifics for the rabbits? I hadn't planned on doing so. Shit, Claire, I've got a school group back there in the auditorium. I'd stupefy them, too, if I could. Eight-year-old, right? So we want the pretty pink bunnies to run away nicely, not sit around looking like they need a cuddle. I'll do it if you want. Your group's show must be almost done by now. It made as much sense as turning the dosage up, but she didn't have to sound so smug about it. You can open the gift shop while you're in there, I called back to her as I walked away. Yes, Dr. Adams, she answered snidely. By the way, the computer flagged up some unusual features in the tertiary associations for one of the kids in your group. I stopped immediately. Which one? Andrew Mickelson, she said, backing through the mosquito room door. It's probably a mistake, but you might want to get it checked. I had the group's visitor pass vid stored on the outreach tablet. School uniforms were back in fashion, and all 18 kids were dressed alike. Andra Mickelson was one of the smaller ones, a gum-chewing non-entity with pale blonde hair, who didn't look like much of a problem for anyone, let alone the company. I breached the internal firewall and scanned the Tertiary Association report myself. Nothing stood out, but I highlighted the tracker on her visitor pass anyway. Inside the auditorium, War of the Mozzies was almost finished. The tactile animation's a bit dated, but most kids still enjoy it. Especially the battle scenes where Professor Kulkarni rallies the audience to help her troops defeat malevolent malaria once and for all. The company eradicated it from Sub-Saharan Africa eight years ago. Our finest hour, supposedly. And although there's still the odd outbreak in Bolivia and the southern parts of Greater China, where MAB Corp's reverse-engineered strains are competing with our own, the next gene patch should solve it. Eradicating our rivals will take a little longer, but we're working on that problem too. Once the teacher and the group's other adults had got the kids settled down, I ushered them back down the hall towards the mosquito room. Part biome, part museum, and easily twice the size of the auditorium, its official name is the Davenport Kulkarni Exhibition. To us inside the company, it's always been the Mosquito Room. They made our reputation and, unlike the rabbits, we are rightly proud of them. Kulkarni's Nobel Prize medal is kept on a plinth right at the very center, surrounded by winding gravel paths and raised pools of dark stagnant water and a swarming, whining haze of thousands upon thousands of Kulkarni's life-saving invention. Many of the company's other patented products are also on show. Five different varieties of fruiting knotweed, a saltwater tank of oil kelp, and a few recent additions like the wishing tree. It's also where we keep the company's infamous pink rabbits, our last official mammalian venture. Supposedly as a reminder never to overstep ourselves again. 
I opened the door and led the group into the mosquito room, aiming a surreptitious kick at the bright pink rabbit, standing bold as anything beside the main path. It bolted for the nearest burrow, fortunately. In their undrugged state, they'll have your fingers off if you get too close. Give the infernal bunnies the wrong kind of food, and they'll do a hell of a lot worse than that. Damned aggressive bastards. Beside me, the teacher counted the group in, head by head, while the door frame did the same thing with the visitors' passes. The kids rapidly dispersed down the branching paths. Hopefully, they would all get bored and head for the gift shop before anyone got bitten. Not that the mosquito room is boring, far from it, but after the auditorium show, it, it can be a bit anticlimactic for youngsters. We let them run around for a while chasing the rabbits until the lure of all the recruitment toys in the shop draws them onwards. The outreach tablet showed that the Mickelson girl had gone down the path that led past the fruiting knotweed beds, so I followed in that direction. An elderly man was meddling with the Kentish Savior plants, a radiophilic subtype we used to clean up Fukushima and the recent contamination at Dungeon S. He clearly hadn't been paying much attention earlier. We do strip the fruits off every morning, but it's still not somewhere I'd choose to linger. The healthy vigor of the plants owes everything to a regular supply of radioactive waste piped directly into the ground underneath. It would die back quickly otherwise. The next bed along was Mineweed 51B, one of my personal favorites. It gets fed every Monday. Crushed up phones, laptops, and notebooks from the start of the century. The first pearl-like fruits show up midweek, and by Friday the whole thing is bedecked with dangling strands of rare earth metals. Today was a Tuesday, and the mineweed was still drab and bare. Unsurprisingly, no one was the least bit interested in it. I moved on, and finally tracked Andrew Mickelson down at the far end of the path. Among a small group of girls who were trying to coax a rabbit out from underneath the oil kelp tank. I watched them anxiously for several minutes until they spontaneously gave up on their game and went to join the crowd around the wishing tree. Ever since its installation, the wishing tree has been our most popular display. It's the demilitarized version, the chem sensors still function, but it responds to perceived hostiles with a pleasant smell, rather than one of our manufactured toxins. The secure comms function has been repurposed. Visitors can scratch their wishes onto the broad, greasy leaves. And instead of being transmitted to an orbital facility, they stop at the Mosquito Room's control computer and the gift shop's fabrication unit. It's all harmless fun. Quite the opposite of the Wishing Tree's sister plants. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Adams. Yes? I turned to see what the man wanted. It was the same guy who'd been messing with the knotweed earlier, and he had one of the company's rabbits cradled in the crook of his arm. Quite oblivious to his peril, he was stroking its pale pink belly fur. Please, uh, put the rabbit down, sir. Delightful creature. It looks just like the Energizer Bunny, doesn't it? Oh, I, I suppose that's well before your time, eh? I tapped the outreach tablet and quietly summoned security. Please, put it down, I repeated. It might bite or scratch you if it gets scared. The old man grinned inanely at me. I was seriously starting to question his sanity. How much to keep it, he said. Hey, it's my granddaughter's birthday next month, and she's rather taken with the critters. I doubted this sentiment would last for very long. And where the hell were security? Surely they weren't all out with damage control teams. That won't be possible, I'm afraid, but we do have a number of plush replicas in the gift shop. I trailed off as a cloying stench filled the air. It wasn't the wishing tree's usual aroma, nor even anything remotely resembling it, but nothing else could have made it. Andrew Mickelson's friends were standing beneath the tree's branches, scratching out their wishes, but she herself was nowhere in sight. The implications of the smell were frightening. The incident at Factory 9 and the old man with the rabbit were both diversions. The company was under attack, but by a prepubescent girl? 
Did she even know what she'd done? I pushed the other kids under the tree aside and started frantically checking leaves. Most of the wishes were simple, juvenile avarice, interspersed with random names and the odd bit of genuine altruism. Some of the kids had drawn pictures instead, or... I stopped what I was doing and backtracked a couple of leaves to the one with the piece of gum stuck close to its petiole and gave it a closer look. My heart sank. What I thought had been bad Mandarin clearly wasn't. I peeled off the gum and found one of the company's own command sigils. I wasn't fluent in the language myself, but I didn't need to be fluent to understand that the raised crown shape now appearing on the darkening leaves was a very, very bad sign indeed. I ran toward the gift shop door, bolting for safety like one of our own deranged rabbits. Whatever it was that Kingdom had done to us, I knew I wanted no part of it. The smell was growing stronger now, and Kulkarni's mosquitoes were dropping dead all around. Dropping like flies, I thought, as the mosquito room slowly rotated around me. My ears were ringing, and it felt like some of the dying insects were crawling around under my eyelids. I blinked, but it didn't do much good. Quite embarrassing for your company, isn't it? Letting children fall afoul of undeclared weapons tech. I blinked again, struggling to bring the speaker's face into focus. Two pale blue eyes glinted above the environment mask that covered nose and mouth, and her head was framed by white blonde hair. Andra Mickelson's face, I thought, but her muffled voice sounded strange and utterly unchildlike to my ears. I tried to speak, but couldn't manage even a groan. I couldn't move either, and my fingers felt like ice. Don't worry, she said. I could barely make out her words above the shrieking whine in my ears. It won't be fatal. Not for them. The mosquitoes were back again. A swarm of darting specks, bright against the darkness that now surrounded the girl's face. I gasped for breath. I could feel a weight on my chest and it seemed to be growing heavier. I hoped it was only one of the rabbits. Welcome back. We're right back. How about that? I wasn't lying. So we got a cast list for this story. Okay. And I am going to assert my editorial dominion and just say that announcer man is doing our cast list for us today. Uh Huh? Really? Yes. Chalupa for you, Big. But he never does nothing. Okay. Since we're both writers... And, you know, we try to watch each other's back. I just wanted to let you know that that's a double negative. Oh, you bully. (laughs) Unfollow. (laughs) Anywho, uh, announcer man. Do you you want to do a cast? Oh, sorry, no want. Please do the cast list. Yes, announcer man. We had several people in this story. Uh, First of all, there's the narrator. And main character whose name was Chris, I believe. Who who played that? Big Anklevich. Okay. Uh, and then there was an old man. I don't remember if he had a name or not. I can't remember for sure. But the old man there at the end that was holding the Energizer Bunny. Who who played that? I don't know. I'm just an announcer. Hey, answer the question. No dodging, sir. You were under oath. Rish Outfield. Thank you. And then there was uh, the girl at the start. I think her name was Claire. Who played that? Renee Chambliss. And lastly, there was the uh, the little girl at the end who, who did the voice of that. Catherine Inskip. Wait a minute. Wasn't she? She's the author. Oh, jeez. How did that work out? Oh, is my face red? See, what? I think what happened is Justin Charles was trying to find somebody who could voice the character, and he just sent her a random email, and he's like, Catherine, there's a small part in a story. It's not a very good story, but we've got a part and we need you to do it. And it turned out it was her own story. Oh, yeah. And I said to Justin, dude, I can't believe you would say that to 
to somebody. I mean, I can't believe you do it in that accent either. I mean, is that, is that supposed to be Liverpool? I mean, that's really, really terrible. Yeah, that really sucks. And uh, he laughed. But I couldn't tell if he laughed because it was intentional. He laughed because he likes to hurt people. Or maybe the people in Liverpool actually do speak that way. Is there a car right next to us? There is. He's pulling right up to see if we're making the beast with two bags. Oh my gosh, it was a little girl with no face. <laughs> Dear God, and there's a cat in the back windshield. Do you see that? I do see the cat. Oh! <laughs> girl with no face! Uh, what's worse, there's a cat. In the yeah, she pulled up to see if we were alive or... It was kind of weird. Yeah. I'm going to lock the doors now. <laughs> Gary, little girl. <laughs> what would a little girl be doing up at this hour? And what With happened no to her face? Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand being up late, but not without a face. I mean, maybe, maybe they were on their way to the hospital, and they saw a car, and they thought, well, we better check. Um, maybe they've lost their faces as well. It's going maybe, around. Maybe their eyes without a face. It's <laughs> a Billy Idol song. They've got no human grace. Okay, so that's that's kind of interesting, though, that she would end up doing a voice for her own story. I mean, what I think would be great is, yes, if he told her, told her it was a really terrible story. No, what would be great is if he didn't tell her what the story was. He just sent her the lines and said, hey, can you get this done by X day? <laughs> and she's recording them, and she's like, wait a minute. What? Yeah, Holy crap. And she realized, you know, like halfway through that they were her own <laughs> Yeah. story. He right? only gave her just her lines and she's like, this line sounds really familiar. Weird. <laughs> Would you recognize your... Uh, okay, so out of context it's just like, let's say it's five lines out of context <laughs> from your story that you wrote years ago. Would you recognize immediately? That's my story. I don't know that I would recognize it at all. I might never recognize it, much less immediately. I guess it depends on the lines. If you're just doing a background character, somebody that wasn't really that important to the story or something, then you may never recognize them. I don't know. That's funny. Okay, so a tradition with the triple word scores, instead of our usual author's note that we do with uh, with all our regular stories, we asked people three questions. Wait, wait, Sorry. In all the episodes we've done, have we ever had an author not send us an author's note? No. I'm pretty sure we've had one every time. Except for, I mean, when we do our stories, we just talk about Instead of doing, like, a a formal author's note, we just say, like, our post-show conversation is the author's note. But we still have an author's note. That's kind so, of amazing, though, that every single author yeah. has... Uh, because sometimes it seems like we've asked, hey, can you do an author's note on this thing? And their response is, fuck you! Yeah, but they still sent the author's note. Oh. Not, you can't say we don't merit that response. <laughs> What's his name? Matthew Sanborn Smith. <laughs> so. Not, not that he was the, the fuck you guy, but he, we would have deserved it in his case. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're going to do the questions. Uh, Rich is going to do the voice of the questionnaire. Questionnaire? Questioner. He's going to put me to the question. And I will be the voice of Catherine and Skip. Okay, so there's three questions, although they're not really three. There's several questions. Each question is three. <laughs> oh, I, I think Young taught us that in, in philosophy class. Number one, was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? <laughs> I think your accent is slipping. <laughs> slipping away. Absolutely. I sent in a few word suggestions as well, as did my husband. And I can't wait to hear some of the other stories, <laughs> which is, of course, proof that this is a very old email because there's only two stories left. Some of the other word combinations given out were interesting, to say the least. For me, writing is probably a 90-10 mixture of fun and frustration. When it's going well, there's nothing like it. When it is not... There's usually a good reason for it. Something fundamentally wrong in how I've set up the scene or what I'm expecting the characters to do while they're stuck inside it. 
I'm not very good at picking up on those problems, mind. So, yeah, I lied. It's more like 50-50 right now for, uh, for most of my writing. Uh, but writing this story was definitely a lot of fun. For starters, it gave me the motivation to finish something. Even better, as soon as I got stuck in, I found that I had a whole world of backstory on my hands, as well as several expansion plots. The 2K word limit meant that I couldn't include any more than a fraction of it. But it also forced me to keep the momentum going and trim out all the fat. Probably for the best, the way I write. Still, I'd like to return to the same setting again one day. Chris's sister is still pissed off about what Chris did to her house several years back. The company are going to go after someone for the Mosquito Room incident. And there are some very dubious shenanigans happening in the Green Ops Catering Division. As for Chris, well, fate worse than death probably sums it up pretty well. The company doesn't waste its human resources. Wow. That, that felt like 2,000 words right there. Maybe we should have put a limit on the, uh, the author's note. Actually, no, I think that's great. I love it when authors say more than four. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, the thing that's, that I take away from this is she sounds like a real writer. When she, you know, she's talking about her process and she's talking about what she came acro- uh, out of it with and what her, how her, her, her work ethic is. I don't think I've ever read anything else that Catherine has written, but she, she probably got stuff out there. And uh, so that's neat. I, I, uh, I've found that every writer who's not me comes up with all sorts of stuff that's like the backbone of their story that doesn't get included in the story. It's all world building and, and background and, and motivation and secrets that the characters have and what their childhoods were like and, and what their greatest fear is and all that stuff that helps them write the story. And it sounds like, at least, our three words were, uh, you know, motivation for her to to think. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if somebody wrote a sequel to a triple-word score story? I don't think that's ever happened. For a good reason. Well, yeah. (coughs) But uh, I don't think we had done a Catherine Inskip story on the show before, and it sounds like she knows what she's doing. Yeah. Okay, sir, question two. Lay it on me. You were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the three words? (laughs) Slipping away. So... Two of them were fairly straightforward. Notebook and invention. Okay, so Notebook had to get shoehorned in rather forcefully once the setting of the story had settled down and near-future tech drift became an issue. Energizer Bunny, on the other hand, was never going to be anything other than a key visual element. So yeah, so yeah, that one had a very big impact. Well, to be honest, my first reaction was, what the fuck? As for how they were used... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I didn't laugh the first time, but this time... <laughs> holy cow. Uh, as for how they were used, I decided pretty quickly that this story was going to have living, breathing, bright pink rabbits. The first draft opened with the protagonist discovering a half-eaten bunny corpse just outside his front door. Something the cat brought in, and later regretted. But not for long, the cat died horribly a few paragraphs later. You're making this up, man. Okay, we're going to get hate mail. Please, <laughs> d- don't embellish. What did she really say? It sounds like I'm embellishing, but she actually said that. You don't, yeah, you don't need to send your hate mail, because that, that was not my words. Did she really say that? However, Catherine Inskip's email address is... In the show notes. Down. It's in the show notes. Send her your hate mail. Unfollow. (laughs) But you can't write about bright pink rabbits without asking yourself what they really are. Who made them, for what purpose, 
and I stopped being interested in this guy tracking down pink rabbits and other conspiracies because I had entitled corporate bioterrorists to play with instead, who do public outreach and sponsor village baking events and honestly believe they're working for the greater good. The greater good. Greater good. Very little of the actual story was about the killer bunnies in the end, but I don't think I'd have happened across it without them. Okay, I, yes, once again, somebody who tosses out huge swaths of their writing, unlike me. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's, that's cool. Um, I guess let's go on to the third question. I... Uh, Third question. And the third question is, who is your favorite doctor? Doctor Horrible. Oh, you mean who? Uh, five, then. Signed, Catherine. Who is also a doctor, but probably not anyone's favorite. Aww. But you know what? She's my favorite doctor, too, now. Aww. What kind of a doctor are you, Catherine? I'm curious. He is proctologist to the stars, stars, stars. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think she's at least, I mean, if she's a doctor, she's at least her husband's favorite doctor. And I think she has kids, so her kids are definitely her favorite doctor. I mean, she's her kid's favorite doctor. That makes more sense now that I put the orders in the correct words. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, sorry, that sounded so much more heartfelt the first time you did. Do you want to try it again? <laughs> Oh, you know what? Uh, something I was telling the listener, and, and there, there were four listeners the first time. Now there's only two. The first time we recorded this episode was that when the Dune Steve was going, when it first got going, Libsyn would only allow us so many minutes or bytes or something like that, so much space each month for, for our Dune Steve episodes. And we would actually have to just sit on episodes. We'd have them done and ready to go. But there was no room to upload them. Uh, Libsyn said, sorry, you're going to have to wait till the new month, the new calendar month. So we were just like, oh, gosh, what, maybe we need to cut out some parts from this episode and make it shorter. And also, we, we used to do that. And now <laughs> it's just, I was like, we could go on and on and on and on. We could record for hours and it wouldn't fill up the allotted time. It just such a crazy change of which is what the normal situation is for this show. Yeah, I think you told that story again before we ran the story. I think you've already told that once this episode as well. (laughs) What I'm trying to say. (laughs) (laughs) So this story had a lot... I mean, it was one of those invention... I don't know. I I see this story as being kind of like one of those... It's a punk. (laughs) Cyberpunk? There we go. I was only thinking steampunk. This story is one of those, like, I, I see it as being like a cyberpunk kind of story. Like, it's in the future to a point where, like, like cyberpunk is always like, oh, yeah, you can put on a helmet and now you're in virtual reality and everything is different and you can't tell the difference between the two worlds and there's all those that kind of stuff. And then there's these kind of stories where it's like you're in the future and you're Biology is malleable, like as if it was just silly putty, and we can just mess with your genes, and now you're a platypus, or we got pink bunnies, or whatever. I, um, I think of that s- a story we did a way, way back, and I have no idea what the title of it is, but you might come up with it as I start talking about it, because sometimes you do that. It was the story where there was these people who they would do modifications to their body all the time. They do, oh, I'm going to have pink skin now, and I'm going to have horns. And people would just do little mods to their body. And then they come across a, a guy, a kid, who is completely unmodified. And this is now the shocker. The, the kid is unmodified. You remember this story? Does it sound familiar? Yeah, I don't remember. What it it's had a about. really, really cool cover. It was one of those stories that you sought out from a magazine, and it was like Neo Genesis or something. Like that. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Uh, it, it reminds me of that story. It's that kind of thing where you know, I don't know if they have a name for that kind of a genre where you're biopunk, maybe. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if some Not, I'm naming idiot it. Had, uh, to, had to ghettoize this story <laughs> by saying, oh, this is this and that is that. Seagull! Thank you. 
So yeah, I, every time I read one of these kind of stories, though, I feel... Do you like what? Like I'm not smart enough. You know what I'm saying? I don't. Does that ever does that ever strike you when you get into some of these kind of future stories? You feel like maybe you're missing something. You're just not smart enough to understand everything. And I'm not really smart, so there's that. Did that ever strike you? Ever? Do you ever get a feel? Do you ever read a story and you feel like, wow, this is for smart people, and I'm not one of them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are certain kinds of stories. Hard sci-fi to, again, ghettoize something. A lot of times I'm just like, oh, okay, well, yeah, they're going into detail. It sounds like they've really done their research, but I wish they hadn't. <laughs> um, that's just me. That's my taste. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I don't have a scientific background or anything like that. I, I, you know, I asked Brian Lincoln if, uh, if he, because he's a smart guy, if he enjoyed The Martian which I, I, I imagine everyone enjoyed. And he you said, bet I have. Oh, yeah, you bastard. I asked him, you know, where, you know, because you know about science and you know about uh, other things that aren't science, and I asked him if, if he was able to still enjoy the, the story or if every single time there was a, a you know, a, a stretch for dramatic purposes or, you know, a, something that wouldn't actually work, he'd be like, oh, I'd jump out. And he's like, no, I basically just have to turn off that part of my brain and just take things on face value and uh, because i remember you and i saw martian together and afterward i said basically if the actor playing the scientist says that it is so i believe it (laughs) yeah i know it's an actor playing a scientist but that's okay i don't know i mean i've heard and maybe this is i don't know if this is true i didn't click the link it was one of those clickbaity stories i don't know but uh uh the headline of the story said i saw there was a headline saying that people, dumb Americans, thought The Martian was based on a true story. Uh, you're joking, <laughs> right? Wait, what? That's what I, I saw a clickbaity story that said that. I didn't read the story, so I can't give you the details. But, I mean, if dumb Americans, idiots, I mean, Americans are really, really the bottom of the crap barrel. Stop it. Oh, We're why? fat. Oh, we're, we're not, the, we're, we're not we're dumb, fattest. we're fat? Oh, okay, that makes more sense then, because I am so fat. How, How fat, fat is he? he? He's so fat, when he sits around the house, he really sits around the house. Big Anklevich, so pathetic it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. Oh, that's all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so dumb Americans thought that the Martian really happened. Yeah, they said they thought it was based on a true story, which I'm guessing that means they did a good job of making that seem realistic. It seemed as though it was Apollo 13. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there were a lot of... Uh connections between it and Apollo 13. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Andy Weir, is that his name, the guy that wrote it? Wait, do you I remember don't know off the top of my head, sorry. Announcer man, who wrote uh, Who wrote The Martian? I don't know, I'm just an announcer. Oh, okay. You've told, said that already, You, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if a lot of The Martian was inspired by Apollo 13. Yeah, probably. Anyhow, sorry, somehow I got off that. Oh, wait, how did we get on... Oh, Brian Lincoln, you'd have to turn Smart off that people. Party. Oh, sci- biopunk. Yeah, biopunk. It. I coined that. Except Makes for you that feel it's dumb. Been coined probably already by someone else. Well, she's a doctor too, Catherine Inskip. Um, not not Brian Lincoln. Oh shit, Brian Lincoln is also a doctor. Yep. Well, everyone is a doctor but us. Have you noticed yep. that? We are dumb Americans. We are. Yeah. And fat. And oh yes, that too. <laughs> Catherine Inskip is a doctor. She's educated. And maybe you can't help but have some of that come through in your writing. One of the things that I love to write is dumb characters. Not characters like Forrest Gump dumb, but characters that are just like a little bit behind. They're a little bit naive. They don't get the joke or whatever. I just, I delight in that, in in letting the audience feel a little bit smarter than the, the characters. But that's not everybody's cup of tea, yeah. If you have a PhD in in nuclear physics uh, then of course you know the stuff that you can write about it's going to be way yeah it's going to be beyond um, uh, other people you can write with authority you can have a nuclear physicist who doesn't sound like Christmas Jones in your (laughs) uh, in your story 
And uh, but then if she's played by Denise Richards, she's gonna sound like Christmas Jones, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've always asked me a lot about, oh, did you like this story? The, the newsroom had another episode, and what did you think of that? Because, yeah, I've had kind of the same problem where they, they just do this and that in shows that are related to news that it strikes as uh, uh, strikes you as unrealistic if you've ever had to work in the news but sometimes you know it doesn't i don't know i mean we watched that show with harrison ford and rachel mcadams in it what was that one called morning yeah it was like morning glory great morning title. glory that's I it nobody went to that where it was set in a you know an early morning news slash entertainment program and you're like yeah did that ever take you out and i'm like you know what it was set in a New York news program, so I'm sure the world is totally different out there. When you're a national program, everything's different than what I, you know, us lowly folk out in the sticks. So, you know, I'm sure it's got to be pretty specific, probably, to uh, to strike you as off. You know, it's got to really hit home and be the thing that you do. I would think, but maybe that's not the case. I mean, I, I guess science is science, and when they make up crap, like when Iron Man creates a new element to power his arc reactor with, probably everyone's just like, oh my gosh, why would they do that? That's not science-y. I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting problem to have to deal with, because, you know, they say to write what you know. Mm-hmm. But you can only do so much of that. Well, right. And you don't want to alienate the, the readers who don't have a PhD. You know what I mean? You have to be able to draw the line somewhere between, I'm going to let people know just how smart I am, and uh, I'm going to make this universal Yeah, for everybody. And, you, and yeah. you're going to have a character or two or many or whatever that, know things that you don't know that you're just going to have to go and kind of research and figure out and say like well I hope this sounds plausible I don't really know this stuff I learned it on Wikipedia uh, hopefully this will pass <laughs> uh, I hope people don't eviscerate me in, all, in my 4,000 reviews 4,000 <laughs> what are you J.D. Vance <laughs> what's his name really <laughs> <laughs> B.V. Larson. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so close. <laughs> but, you know, Wikipedia gets a bad rap, but I, 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 Wikipedia is invaluable. Yeah. And all of those people that are going to bitch and complain about your scientific accuracy, their day job should be checking those Wikipedia files so that they are accurate. <laughs> Those people that are going to bitch about your scientific accuracy would bitch about what something else if it wasn't that. Well, I'm just saying, people always say, wow, he did all his research on Wikipedia. Um, so? That's, that's the Encyclopedia Britannica of the Internet. There, there are millions of proofreaders going through there. It's not just me going through and saying, yeah, he's, he did the wrong there. I'll fix that. <laughs> I've done that where I'm fixing something and it's like, no, this has already been fixed. Somebody at the exact same time was ta changing T-H-E-W-R, which is a really bad spell there, to T-H-E-I-R at the same time that I was. And I just, oh, wow. Okay. That is uh, triple redundancy there, kids. Interesting. I edit Wikipedia. Yo. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think that's a one of the... Uh, Warning signs, your son may be a nerd if he <laughs> edits Wikipedia. Mosquito Room. Yes. Oh, okay. She wrote this dang thing so long ago. There may be a sequel. There may be a... Not, but somebody wrote a Dune Steve, a story for the Dune Steve and turned it into a novel. Who was that? I don't know if they turned it into... They claimed they wanted to. Claimed they were going to... That was uh, like a year in some odd time ago when we first started into these triple word score stories, though. So I think that it could be possible. 
I believe Jimmy Carter was president when we started these triple word score stories. That's so true. That, that's been a while. That's true. You know, it's just it's think, been a while. Just thinking about you always use that that Carter administration joke. Okay. Uh, to talk about old stuff, and I was talking with somebody at work the other day. And I realized when I started talking about it, I said, you know what? I've been I've been a video editor since Bill Clinton was the president. And that was kind of weird to consider. That's not that many presidents ago, I guess, when it's, I mean, it's there's only been two since then. Mm-hmm. But that was 16 years ago. Come on. Yeah, see, I've been a moron since Ronald Reagan was president. Oh, so okay. I got you beat. I've been fat... Since Dwight D. Eisenhower <laughs> was the president, so there. <laughs> All right, folks. So, uh, you got anything uh, else that you need to add to this episode before we call it a day? No, I. I, I think apologize you're... that that there's not more of these. You know, thank you for uh, saving our bacon again, Justin Charles. Uh, maybe I already said that three times, but. And is he the one that doesn't like to be singled out and thanked? Oh yeah, don't say his name. Um, it's he's a little oh, bit like oh crap, we already did. Man. But uh, again, yeah, he he helped us out. I want there to be more episodes. There's just not going to be. Um, you feel free to donate. It's not going to make a difference, but it will ensure that Big and I get together. And you know, when we're together, we tend to talk about podcasting and writing, and that's good. And it's good to to have a friend. And, and you can in facilitate the diamond business. That. Now you have a friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are going to have a few. Uh, our episodes may see a little uptick for a little while because we're going to have a couple of stories that are ready to go. So there is that. So you can look forward to a few episodes. So yes, donut. It, it might make a difference. Uh, yeah. Also, we have been talking about doing a Christmas episode. Feel free if you'd like to go on Facebook or in the comment section of this this episode let us know if you'd like us to do a christmas episode if you're willing to do your uh, voice on it or, yeah egg us on or donate to the dang show i know i've double dog that a dare lot. us but i listen to other podcasts and they ask for donations every single time it's a rote thing they say it word for word every single time and maybe if we did that there would be more donations i just you know me i don't want to do it i don't like being that guy but yeah feel free to do that and and show Show us you care and that you're happy we're back if we're back or want us oh, to be back. We're back. Or you damn it. If you've got our back. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to everybody. We're out of time. This has been Rich Outfield and uh, bye. If you enjoyed today's episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, please drop by iTunes and give us a five star rating. We'd be eternally grateful you did. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. Water filtration screwed. There's untreated effluent. Sounds right to me. There's untreated affluent everywhere. Andra Michelson. I think that's Mickelson, but it doesn't matter because oh, this sorry. isn't really you. Okay. And Andra Mickelson. Inside the auditorium, War of the Mozzies was almost finished. Mozzies, right? You think? I think so. Where the MAB Corps. Should I say the P it is corpse, right? Because it's short for corporation. Sure. Not core, like the... Did military. I say core? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. I was the girl. <laughs> it bolted for the nearest... Burrow. Give the infernal bunnies the wrong kind of food, and they'll do a hell of a lot worse than that. Damned aggressive bastards. They'll turn into gremlins if you give them food. After midnight. An elderly man was meddling with this Kentish Savior plants. An elderly man was meddling with the Kentish Savior... Dang it. 
don't know what it is, but schist Wait till we get to together. radiophilic isotope. Oh, subtype, never mind. It's the shish and the sss together. I have a hard time saying them. This may be the most difficult sentence of your life. Read it. <laughs> Look at it. I, I, I don't think I could pull this thing off. Look at that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow you away right now. Oh, you're going to blow me? Yeah. Away. An elderly man was meddling with the Kentish savior plants, a radiophilic subtype we used to clean up Fukushima and the recent contamination at Dungeness. Is it Dungeness or Dungeness? No effing idea. Well, Justin, who's going to be editing this now, is British. Is he? And so is Catherine Inskip. Is she? So I'm going to say it both ways. And since he's British, he will know which way is right. Will he? I don't know. <laughs> but I hope so. Okay. Let me do it again. Among a small group of girls who were trying to coax a rabbit out from underneath the oil kelp tank. That should be more like one word, huh? <sighs> Among a small group of girls who were trying to coax a rabbit out from underneath the oil kelp plant. Ah, he had it. Missed okay. it? Bye. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Adams. Yes? I turned to see what the man wanted. It was the same ugly guy who'd been messing with the knotweed earlier, and he Wait, had... why did you call me ugly? Because you are! Right, but... Where did you get ugly from, though? Oh. Yeah, I guess it's not in there. You piece of crap. <laughs> Is ugly nowhere else? That's weird. Where did I get that from? I must have just done something with Freudian. Guy. Maybe it's just because the voice came from uh, ugly guy. Bastard. <laughs> just read the story. I stopped what I was doing and backtracked a couple of leaves to the one with a piece of gum stuck close to its petiole. All right, should I try? Petiole. You'll never find it. Petiole. Yeah, that's right. I rock. I'm going to kick you in the petiole, by the way. Oh. I've lost my place, though. I could feel a weight on my chest and it seemed to be growing heavier. I hoped it was only one of the rabbits. Bomb, bomb, bomb. So what do you think Justin should do for the little girl's voice? Should he just use my voice? Uh, I'm, I'm getting the impression she's not a little girl at all. Right. I would think a female's voice instead of yours okay her muffled voice sounded strange and utterly unchildlike but he can do what he wants the hell was that that was me cocking the pistol oh okay <laughs> that's cute <cool. laughs> all right recording once again oh this is going to be delightful what were we singing <laughs> I don't know, First you said something through. and then I sang something else. I sang the... All I ever wanted, all I ever needed was here in my arms. Words are very unnecessary. They can only do harm. Luciano Pavarotti, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh boy, um, hello. Welcome to the Dean Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Is that really what this thing is called? Yes. Is it too late to change the name? Yes. Yeah. Um, remind me who Catherine is married to. I, she has the unique distinction of having a husband who also entered and won the triple word score story called Two Uh... You know what I'm talking about. The three words that we talked hours and hours about but apparently weren't recording. Right, yeah. The Turbo War score. That! That thing! Uh, I, I believe her husband is Jeremy Carter? 
Oh, okay. If Jeremy Carter. Right. Now, does he ever do voices? He does them all the time in the shower. Oh, I'm just... I'm, I'm imagining a scenario in which Justin Charles asks Jeremy Carter to do voices, not telling him it's for his wife's story, and he's complaining about the story afterward. <laughs> and she's like, what? Did you catch the name of the story by any chance? And he's like, yeah, uh, mosquito netting, something like that. Oh, geez, a mosquito room? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what it was. Did you catch by any chance the author's name? No, but he sucks. <laughs> Whoever it is, I wish he died. I'd hate to be married to that guy. That is Rich. <laughs> rich Girardi. Oh. He okay. hasn't done a voice in a long time. Sir, what are you doing? I'm looking up Jeremy Carter. Okay. To see. If there are any juicy Instagram pics, show me. Oh, ho, ho, ho! First thing that comes up is In the Gloaming. He wrote In the Gloaming? No. Oh. The uh, cover. He may not have written a story. Oh my lord! Really? <laughs> so all of this is bullshit. The yeah, he is also one of the winners of the triple word scores. Yeah, you triple may need crown to cut that out. Kentucky Derbyan. I think we had Adam and Jennifer Gifford that both wrote a story. Oh shit! This whole time I've been confusing Adam Gifford and Jeremy Carter and Jeremy Carter produced. The episode for In the Gloaming. Oh, my Lord. What do I do with all this? Outtakes? Maybe. Uh, you might be able to uh, just remove the bit where you say he also wrote a story and just say, I'm really, I'm trying to think of a situation where... does he?" Because you asked if he does voices. Yeah. I think you might be able to do something with it. Anyways, moving on. Let me tell you of the days of the Doonsteep Audio Fiction Magazine. And now behold your hosts, the Dread Big Anglovich and the infamous Rishoutfield. 